we're going to be talking about uh, Leonard Anderson today. And um, I, you know, the digital images are, are good quality digital images that I've gotten for him. But his work is so subtle and so much about the paint quality that that until you see some of his work in person, you really can't appreciate the the quality of of what it is. But you know, we'll 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 go forward with this. They um, organized a retrospective of his work um, this past year at the um, New York Studio School. And um, basically that, that show is touring the country. It went to Lyme, Connecticut and just left there a couple of weeks ago and it's going out to Utah. I don't think it's gonna be back this way, but his work is in the collection of the Dreyfus Foundation, which is over in Mount Kisco. I don't know how many of the pieces are there right now because I think a lot of the, the they have eight in their collection, I believe, and those are in that retrospective, but we can get access to these pieces. So there's also, he's um, re, his work is represented by Lee Morse Fine Arts in New York City. So that's another way to get to see some of his work. Anyway, born in Detroit, um, died in 2015, born in 28. Um, he um, studied at the Art Institute in Chicago and Cranebrook Academy. And then he also studied at the Art Students League for a period, of, a brief period of time, I believe, with Edwin Dickinson. And I, I will show you some of Edwin Dickinson's work and you'll see the relationship between them pretty quickly. Uh, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship, National Endowment for the Arts Grant, Tiffany Foundation Grant, and the Prix de Rome. Um, uh, his work is in the Brooklyn Museum, uh, Cleveland Museum, Hirschhorn, uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Whitney, um, the Pennsylvania Academy. He's been all over the place. Um, and taught for a long period of time at Brooklyn College, but also taught at Yale and Columbia. Um, he's, he was a really accomplished painter and, and very um, knowledgeable about art history and integrated that into his work. So with that being said, we're gonna move on to this. Um, Anderson's work does not come out at us. You really need to spend time and, and coax the nuance out of these pieces. They're very subtle. They're very quiet. Um, beautiful, rich color and texture. Um, very subtle, smart painting. Um, you get some idea of what the work is about. The paint quality, the subdued tonal and um, color range is, um, is really kind of impossible on a screen, but you'll, 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 get, you'll get a feel for what the work is about. Um, okay. Okay, so th this particular piece is, is a really wonderful example. Um, when you start to look at it, there's large, broad areas of, of color, but if you start to really look at it, there's, there's all this brushwork that in each of these sections is functioning in very different ways. Uh, um, basically, if you look at the, the, um, the cloth that's behind her head, and you can notice the, um, the, scumbling the the way the the way the brush marks allow the underpainting to show through that glow of orange is in there it kind of unifies that whole background but then the directionality of the marking the the uh vertical marking in the, in that area and then the horizontal marking in the patch next to it 
and then this this glazing quality in in the patch after that and then there's lines in the other section so if you look at each one of these sections the brushwork is is a little different and it's it's really part of of what he really consciously put into this now this is an old piece this is from 1959 um these pieces uh, the one on the lower right is from 1953, and the landscape is from 1960. So these are reaching back there. Um, he actually won a Prix de Rome in, in 1958. So this um, uh, Miss Susie Peterson was, was painted in Italy in, uh, when he was on his uh, Rome Fellowship. Okay, only that which does not teach, which does not cry out, which does not persuade, which does not condescend, which does not explain, is irresistible. This is a quote from Yeats, uh, and, and a favorite quote of Leonard Anderson. And you can see what I'm saying, you need to really you know, listen to these paintings because they whisper, they don't shout, um, which is very different from a lot of what was going on at that time in, in, in the 60s. Okay. And now we're on to um, this uh, very small enigmatic painting. It was um, at, at the Cranebrook Academy where he, where he went to school, which is a very reputable school in, in Michigan, they used to call him Little Rembrandt, uh, and so he was he was very much into the old masters. But this is a very kind of enigmatic, strange image: the falling man. You know, uh, he was drawing from the old masters. So you know, Frau Angelica, the massacre of the innocents would would have been something that he was aware of, and and basically trying to integrate. Um, these restrained colors with this kind of dramatic event. Um, interesting, small painting, 10 by eight inches or eight by 10, excuse me. Um, you know, here's a uh, street scene, study for street scene. And this is a small painting also. This is, this is again, he's in Italy. So he's, he's exposed to a lot of the old masters and the, large compositions with many figures in them and all of that. So he's trying to really work out his relationship with that. And here is a larger scale version of, of, of that piece. And here's a close up of, of, of one of those, of, of one area of that. Um, So this larger version of this kind of odd drama um, has a lot of references to the old masters. Um, in, you know, you can see the spatial relationships between the figures. It kind of harkens back to uh, Della Francesca where the figures are very substantial and sculptural and the space between them is really clear you can see how they sit in space in relationship to each other so this is something which he would have been looking at there's a mystery about these paintings an unspoken implicit narrative that even the humblest still life even in the humblest still lives that this sort of comes out um okay all right and you know there's I don't have a date on this little little landscape, but it's it's just a really beautiful little plein air piece. It would have been done very quickly. And then below on, on the lower right is a self-portrait painted in 1965. Um, I did a little diagram of of the central axis and the and the uh, the the symmetrical uh, under underpinning to this painting. And one of the things, let's see if I can get the pointer up here. And then pointer, 
arrow. Okay, good. Let's see. Can you see that arrow? Joan, can you see the arrow? Yeah, we can see it. Great, perfect. Okay, so what what we have here is, you know, the the this is a small painting. Again, it's it's thirteen by ten inches. Um, but if you if you look at this, see see where the cross the cross is in the dead center. So this is just off that dead center. It comes out on this side up here. Okay, you see the angle on his shoulders you can especially see it in this in this little drawing this little sketch that i did you can see how this is is drawn forward by by this plane coming up so the turn in his body is is much more radical than than you know basically you look at it at first it's just he looks like he's just sitting there but there's actually some really interesting dynamic compositional elements that he's using to to enliven this this little self portrait okay okay and this is this is a small again a small still life um but if you look at this um it's 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 painted with a palette knife. So it's barely thick paint. Um, and if you look at how this paper plate uh, comes through the glass in this, in this blue, blue cup and comes out over here. Now, the length of this, of this, uh, this plastic, this uh, paper, plate is is elongated through the inside of this thing he did that to pull that handle out if if that hadn't been there it wouldn't stand out quite as much and the spatial things that are happening inside this little still life would not be as as interesting as they are without that without that little thing in there it just doesn't 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 work quite as well okay and here are some more of, of the still ice. Um, the teapot is dead center. You know, again, that this crosses, this tabletop crosses dead center in this, in this canvas, and this passes dead center in that, and the teapot is right in the middle of all that. Now, uh, I learned in school you're not supposed to do that it's like it's like hitting hitting a a, a, a donkey in the head with a two by four um, but this works in in a way because of what he does with the with the glass bottle that's in front of it and the distortions that he plays with inside of that and softens it 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 makes it makes this symmetry of the of this thing just slightly off and he plays with the with the placement of the objects around that beautiful subtle stuff okay and then still life with popcorn popper when you look at this at first it's a it's a beautiful painting it's really you know pleasant it's it's you know uh, um a kind of a genre of painting of of everyday life and all that if you start to look at it a little bit more there are, there's this grid business that's going on that he's playing with in that background um wallpaper pattern and then the grid that's happening inside the tablecloth and then when you look a little bit more at this notice how this table goes up that way up here comes across that way and gets wider out here and comes up here. It's backwards perspective. What he's doing is making this end of the table wider than this end of the table. And why is he doing that? Well, number one, if he used real honest to God perspective, the tabletop would come in someplace like this. And that didn't give him enough room back there. 
it also didn't give him the ability to bring this big red handkerchief or or table um, uh, napkin across and and build this nice big field of color in there. He's also playing with muted complementary colors. Red and green are complementary colors on the color wheel. They set up a, a certain kind of vibrance when, when you look at them. So he's got this greenish turquoise um, berry bin sitting upside down on the table and this cabinet back here, the cabinet door, that's this kind of heel green um, playing off of these reds. So there's a lot going on in this little still life that you wouldn't notice. It's not just observational. He has been, you know, he's, he's linked to perceptual painting, but he was also really knowledgeable about using distortion to make things work. And it's something he learned from Cezanne. Um, okay, and then there's this lower one on the lower left. It's a really beautiful piece. I wish I had a, uh, I, I should have given it a whole uh, page because it's really a gorgeous little piece. And there's this glow on the outside of the Jiffy Pop popcorn popper that, that um, is, is actually accentuated by the, the, the blue gray interior of the thing. But I really love this piece. I mean, you know, um, it's his form of pop art. <laughs> Okay, and and again, the use of the grid, the use of 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 the structure in in this this strawberry basket. If you were to draw a crosshair across the center of this painting, the strawberry that's inside the basket is dead center on it, and then everything else is moving around the outside of it. So basically, there's movement through this thing created by that, that, that center focus. Um, and, you know, here is this beautiful portrait that he did. Um, I believe this was from the eighties. I, I, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent certain right now. Um, but it is, it is a really lovely, you know, piece. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move on. Larry, we uh, have a question. Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, whoops, I just lost it. Uh -oh. um, was he influenced by Chardin and Cezanne? By Chardin. Chardin and Cezanne are, are, and we'll be talking more about them in a little while. So you're okay. foreshadowing, you got it already. Um, yes, absolutely. He was influenced by Chardin uh, and, and Cezanne specifically the use of distortion, the use of, 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 of the directionality of the brushwork and all of that. But again, Chardin is there too. So yes, <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, so um, this is, this is, it's a really beautiful little piece, this one. I, I, um, I really, love this fresh head of lettuce again vast one sitting you know before it wilts he had to get it down there so the the background is this really warm color and then the the green so it's again this business of the muted complementary colors where there's a warmth in that background and there's the coolness of the of the head of lettuce um there are, let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's see if I've got the zoom. Yeah, okay. I want to come in here and you see that little, little hint of red in the, in the bottom of the, the lettuce head, you know, and you can see that reflection of the, of the, the ground color it, up into the leaves. Yeah, he did a lot of these 
you know, fruits and vegetables and stuff like that, really quick paintings. He spent a very long time on the more developed compositions with the figures in them, spent a long time on the figurative paintings too. He would spend, you know, many, many sessions um, to do the portraits. Okay, Chardin <laughs> is, is located on a stone ledge seen nearly at eye level in, uh, in front of a dark void, a beautiful convention. Even though Chardin's technique can be bold, even rough, it, it, is, it is so at the service of the motif. The visible facts of nature uh, look that results are taken for granted, okay? Uh, Chardin does not conceal his method, but the mystery remains. That's because we do not question the motif the way Chardin does. He questions, then he retains the answer in paint. He goes over and over the question until he's satisfied that he can do no better. So this little Chardin is the answer to that question, yes. <laughs> he, he did look at Chardin. And below is another, another one of, of, of my favorites. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a zoom so we can get a look at some of the, the brushwork. Okay, this is, the, this is a Mirandi. And again, um, looked long and hard at Cezanne to come up with the directionality of the brushwork, the subtleties of these colors, the warms and muted warms and cools. And this is a guy who was, who was right up uh, uh, Anderson's alley. And here is the Chardin. And, you know, you can see, you can see the relationship to, to Chardin. Of course, Leonard Anderson looked long and hard at Chardin and, and really took those lessons to heart. But he took them into, you know, a contemporary space. Um, so um, that quote, this Chardin quotation here was straight from Leonard Anderson. So this is, this is him talking about Chardin. Okay, and um, you know here is again another another example of using using that cross the cross hatch in the center. Um, above you see, um, oh, sorry. Um, above you see an example of the golden mean. Okay, basically this structure in nature is something which is found over and over again. And it's used by the old masters and by Leonard Anderson as a way of organizing and distributing objects in the composition. The other thing about this is, is you know, this, is, this painting goes straight down to canvas over here in the corner. You know, basically, this was this was painted very quickly before the uh, the tangerine had a chance to shrivel, before the the um, the cupcake had a chance to get uh, stale. Unlike Cezanne, he used to spend weeks and months sometimes, and sometimes his onions would grow sprouts and ch change completely. Um, with these small pieces, um, Leonard Anderson tried to paint them very quickly and get have a really fresh quality to them. Um, okay. For me, painting from nature is akin to playing music. The notes are there. One tries to get them down in the proper proportion 
to bring out the proper impression. Realizing your palate is limited. It cannot begin to have the richness and depth from light to dark that nature encompasses or the subtlety of it. Nature seems to strain for its effects and yet it has so much power. One always wants to feel confident that one is painting what one sees, but nature is not always what it seems. So Anderson's um, uh, reference to, to nature is going to be his interpretation. It has to be, as it is for all of us. But, but um, his, his, his method, the, the way of, of approaching these paintings is very fresh and very alive. These are, again, small scale pieces. Okay, back now. So um, this was this was painted when he I think he had moved to New York by by this time. He decided to move to New York when he continually read these reviews by this guy Fairfield Porter in one of the art magazines, and said, "Well, if this guy Fairfield Porter can write like this and think this way, there might be a place for me in New York." So he moved to New York, and this is this is one of his attempts, early attempts at dealing with that Arcadian theme, which comes back again in the seventies and in the eighties, and even to the the you know just before his death, he was working on another one of these kind of Arcadian scenes, um, and you know again this is reference to to. Um, the old masters. And here you see 76, 77, 77, 78. These are um, more fully realized pieces of that in that in that genre that he that he's trying to play with. Um, as I work over paintings, I am really just trying to get things within the painting to be less annoying to me. <laughs> I'm trying to make make a painting that doesn't embarrass me. I'm not particularly interested in realist painting, quote unquote. I'm painting surfaces. I'm painting how things fall together and separate out. To do that, you have to put something on the table that means something to you. Again, Leonard Anderson. Beautiful, big compositions, really wacky, you know, at that time. Um, it, it, he was a very influential teacher. The, there, there are a lot of people who went to Brooklyn College who studied with him for many years. And, um, and there are a lot of artists out there who... Um, sing his praises and and i've got i've got some um uh, videos and youtubes at the end that i'll i'll uh, basically recommend again okay pelvis de chardonnay um this is um this piece is at the Metropolitan Museum, but you can see the relationship between, between this kind of neoclassical um, uh, setting that, that Anderson is playing with. And these are some of his favorites, you know, Poussin, the complexity of these of these um, you know compositions, the the gestures and movement and all of that are are in there. Um, again, Corot, um, a big a big influence of one of his favorites, especially for for, for doing the portraiture and all of that, and 
Ang was somebody that he looked at a lot and really, you know, paid attention to, um, talked talked a lot about. I didn't I didn't put a quote in from from him on this one, but okay. And again, you can see in this piece from 1961, this was just hmm. He may still have been in Rome. He was there for three years. So he may still have been in Rome when he when he did this composition. He didn't feel like he was ready to do it until he went to Rome and and really, you know, got to study those old masterpieces. So if you look at the Poussin and you look at all the gestures and movement and and that whole idea, and then you go to this street scene. And it's, again, it's this strange kind of, we don't know what the heck is going on here, uh, but you, you can see how compositionally he's playing with those figures. Um, many of these, he did not work directly from uh, models. He, he said uh, he really didn't want to have models for these because he stands around not knowing what he's doing for periods of time, and he would be embarrassed to do that in front of a model, <laughs> which is crazy, but there you go. So he used a lot of photographs when he was doing these, these uh, more complex compositions. And again, um, standing nude, this is his, hmm, it might've been his first wife. I'm not sure about that. Um, but here we have um, Degas. He, he really loved Degas. Um, and um, it, you know, basically, there's a certain kind of classicism in this. It, it kind of, there's a sort of objectivity to how many of the, the um, Degas um, bathers and, and, and uh, dancers, he kind of catches them at an um, unguarded moment. And that's sort of, you know, something though, though again, this is that neoclassical thing in, in Anderson. That nude is kind of more, more um, uh, in that category than, than the kind of candid shot of, of, of Degas. Okay. And this is um, Piero della Francesca. Um, And he used the head of that of that figure in this St. Mark's Place um, uh, composition. Again, look at the length of time that it took him to paint this painting. He started in 1970 and finished it in 1976. It's big. It's 94 by 74 inches. Um, it. The interesting part about a piece like this is it's it's mixing. Della Francesca with a heavy dose of Edward Hopper. Um, that it's kind of, you know, it's it's a it's a contemporary scene, but it's got the stillness and and um quiet of of a Della Francesca. The figures in space in relationship to each other. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, this wonderful kind of emergent portrait of Rita is late in, in, his, in his career. This is 2012, and he died in 2015. Um, by this time, he was actually suffering from macular degeneration. So he, when he painted this painting, he was getting up really close to the canvas to really see what he was doing when he was painting it but it's just got such a subtle nuance to it. And, and, you know, I put it up next to this Pompeian fresco and that quality of, of, of those frescoes, of, of all of that was something which, which you know, the brushwork that, that um, Leonard Anderson used kind of simulated that, 
that dry surface, that kind of um, soft edge. And, and he would keep the, the portrait very soft until it emerged and, and got it to where he wanted, to be, wanted it to be. Um, okay, and I put up this, this Baltus. Um, Baltus is, is definitely you know, one of those figurative painters that, that Leonard Anderson would have been aware of. Um, I, I, picked, I picked this piece because um, the compositions are you know, fairly similar. Although you can see the difference between Leonard Anderson and what he's doing with this kind of neoclassicist figure, it's not erotic. It's not. It's not. Um, you know, there's a sort of um, uh, perversion in in uh, in many of Baltus's work, and many people really hate his work because of that. Um, but the paint quality and the compositional elements that that Baltus used are something which is a. There's definitely a kinship between them in in the in the the effect of the paint and and the quality of what of what they were up to with that aspect of the formal aspects of it anyway okay and i saw this this uh uh portrait and and knew you know he loved velasquez and so you know this this guy with the mustache with the little goatee. I I just it's it's such a, a parallel between the two of them. So Leonard Anderson knew what he was doing as far as like you know integrating art history into his paintings. It was very much something that 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 he was he was very aware of doing and and playing with that is something that he loved to do. So, you know, they may be uh, a few centuries apart, but, uh, but they, they could be relatives. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, and this is, he had a summer house in Maine, um, and this kind of harkens back to some of his roots in, in the lineage, um, back to American Impressionism. Um, he actually studied with uh, Edwin Dickinson, and Edwin Dickinson studied with Hawthorne, who set up a, a school out in, in Provincetown. Actually, actually Dickinson um, summered out in Cape Cod. He stayed out there after, after his experience as a student with Hawthorne. Hawthorne studied with Chase. Chase had a school out in Long Island at the Shinnecock Hills. And, and that, was, that was where he had his summer camp that Hawthorne learned from Chase and set up that school out in, in uh, Provincetown, fashioning it after Chase, his experience with Chase. So there's a lineage here uh, from, from Chase to Hawthorne, to Dickinson, to our man, Leonard Anderson. And um, Dickinson, and and Anderson both loved Corot and and that kind of beautiful mud. Uh, and here is uh, um, a Leonard Anderson on the left and an Edwin Dickinson on the right. Um, it's how things combine with other things that fascinates me. When you look at nature from a distance, you can see how, how it all fits together. There's a harmony and that's what interests me. 
That's a quote from Leonard Anderson. And again, here's a still life from Edwin Dickinson. Um, and the two below are, are uh, Leonard Anderson pieces. You can see the relationship. Now, uh, Leonard Anderson did not study long with, with Edwin Dickinson, but, but he, did, he did study with him at the Art Students League for a period of time, a few months. I don't know how long it was, but he, he actually asked Edwin Dickinson to write him a letter for the Prix de Rome, and Dickinson um, felt strongly enough about his work to write him a really stellar letter. Okay. And again, you can see that that structural business that I was talking about before, the golden mean is in there, you know, the crosshairs, the, the, the use of, of um, uh, that kind of underlying grid pattern is in there. The, the movement through the objects, kind of that, that swirl of the, of the, the golden mean is in there, it's present. Um, beautiful paintings, you know, beautiful. Eh, let me get, let me, let me zoom in a little bit. We might as well show off some of this paint surface. These beautiful, beautiful brush, brush works. And you can see how thin the paint is. I mean, he really, you know, kind of breathed it on. Uh, okay. Very humble. Okay, and again, here's one of his late, um, beautiful um, Arcadian pieces. He worked on this um, until, you know, he died in 2015. So this was, you know, started in 2012 and, and uh, into 2014. Um, and there's a whole series of these. It's a large scale piece. It's, you know, 50 by 60. Um, and there's a whole group of these paintings that were left in the studio. And speaking of Cezanne, I think my chief attraction, the chief attraction for me is the discipline he brings to his stroke. It's primarily a building stroke, not, not a descriptive stroke. Also the lightness of his key and the importance he places on structure. He's not unlike other great painters in, in that he has a signature quality, a relationship of tone that is fresh, tones that retain light and are unique to him. That's a quote from Leonard Anderson and this beautiful, beautiful Cezanne sketch. Small Larry? scale, but yes. Oh, we have a question. Go um, ahead. He seems to have gone from oil to acrylic. How come? He went back and forth between oil and acrylic. Um, there are qualities that you can get out of acrylic when you're painting large scale that you can get really quickly. And I think that that, that was valuable to him at that point. Um, there is a gritty quality to acrylic that that simulates the quality of a um, of a mural that's painted on a wall. Um, and he actually did do some some frescoes um, of his own. Uh, I didn't include them here because I don't think they're quite as successful as a lot of these other pieces. But that's just one man's opinion and. Other people may feel differently about that, <laughs> but yeah, um, thank you for asking that. I mean, there there is a real um, when you look at his small small still lives, most of those are in oil, okay, because he wants that shimmering quality and that kind of translucence. When he's working on those larger scale pieces, he's building them up in layer after layer. And, and the acrylic really was suitable to that because that way he could let it dry and come back in. 
Okay. And here's a little view from inside his studio. You can see the scale of these little sketches. I showed you that that painting that's in the middle um, earlier. And um, there's his, his, uh, his tools um, <laughs> and this beautiful portrait, beautiful portrait. And, you know, you don't, you actually, not many of his things incorporate his interiors quite as clearly as it, as it is in this one. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it in um, at this point. And here it is. This is a, you know, a 1986. It was not a late self-portrait, but it's a self-portrait in that little mirror back there. Um, and again, very subtle color. We really can't see from, from this uh, digital image how lovely and how subtle and how nuanced these, these colors are and how they work together. Um, the plastic cup with lemons, really beautiful little still life. Maybe I can, maybe I can pop up our zoom and take a closer look at that for a moment. Lovely little piece. And again, you know, we're right back to that structural thing. Look at where that cup sits in the dead center of that, of that composition. Really interesting, just slightly off kilter. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, unexp the unexplained is irresistible, a discussion on the work of Leonard Anderson. This is from the, this is an, about an hour and a half long talk, a good one. Um, uh, some of the people that helped put the show together are involved and some people who wrote about him extensively. Uh, um, there's also a series that that's there's the each part is only about you know 10 to 15 minutes long but there's eight of them and those are all with him talking about his work and talking about the slot talking about a slide presentation there's also one Leonard Anderson in his studio and there's a bunch of those where he's painting and talking at the same time uh, which is kind of interesting too um for, for good measure, I'm just gonna throw this in. Diana Horowitz was somebody who studied with him. Actually, she was a, a student at SUNY at Purchase when I was there. So I, I've known her work and known her uh, work to change. She went to Brooklyn College and studied with him. Uh, she shows now with um, uh, a bunch of galleries in the city um, and Jane, uh, Susan Jane Walp shows with, um, uh, oh God. Well, she shows with a really reputable gallery in Midtown and it'll come back to me when I'm not talking to you anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, just so, <laughs> okay, there we go. That That is it. Um, Nothing I, else? I, uh, well, actually, at some point, maybe we'll set up a, um, a visit to the uh, Dreyfus Foundation and go actually get to see some Leonard Andersons and a lot of other things in person. Are you talking about the one in Mount Kisco? The one in Mount Kisco. I, I, is it still functioning? I oh, it's it still functioning. Yes, okay. they, they, are, they, are, they are still open. They don't, it's not a gallery. You set up an, uh, uh, an appointment and go in and they take you on tour of the collection. You know, Larry, well, when I'm, we're both in on Monday or maybe Wednesday, we'll discuss this, okay? Sure, okay. Yep. Okay, you have some questions before you leave. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of compliments too. Um, okay. Just thank you, these rich Claire Webber, those wonderful paintings, thank you for sharing. And they asked about uh, Horowitz. Is she married to Larry Horowitz? No, 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 no. Different Horowitz altogether. Okay. We were all at school together. <laughs> Larry Horowitz and Diana Horowitz. <laughs> um, so somebody asked if you could send the attendees the links to the presentation. Um, I don't know if we could send those links to you, but I the only thing we could offer is you could, these uh, 
videos, these programs are being videotaped. Right. And yeah. so you could, you know, access it when you want to. You know, and I'm going to go back here. Mm -hmm. And and also what you can do is write down really quickly the titles that are on, on here and, okay. and just go to YouTube and you'll get to them. Okay. So, um, you know, yes, you can, you can actually, what you can do is, is when this is up and running, which is usually a week from now, um, you can go to the, the, um, the archive and pull, go, go directly to the end of this talk and freeze this page so you right. can copy it off of there. Yeah. Oh, and then somebody just mentioned something very clever. She took a picture of this screen. Great idea. That's great a great idea. One. Thank you, Claire. That was, yeah, that was get, your, get your get your phone out and take a shot. Take a shot <laughs> of the frame. Yes. Um, and then somebody wanted to know, whoops, I just lost it. Um, hold it. Will you give a talk on Milton Avery at the Wadsworth? Oh, I ju we just gave a talk no. on Milton Avery yeah. at the Wadsworth. So, Claire, go back. Um, if you if you go into the archive, um, basically what you do is you go to the home page uh, for the library, and and scroll down and on the right hand side you'll see archived lectures and and programs programs, and you click on that and basically the Milton Avery thing should come up first thing really soon yeah yeah because we might that have was to. We might have to try to separate all the author talks from the art lectures because it becomes cumbersome for people. So yeah, um, that's a huge job. I don't know what's going to be happening with that. Okay. All um, right. We the only thing we now separate is the foreign policy discussion group, which has right. its own link. So yeah. uh, sorry, it's just um, we don't handle that. That's not part of uh, the library's uh, works. So somebody else handles that, and they're might be too much for them i don't know yeah. so um thank you all right larry great. it was a great job and i will speak to you at five today unless you bet before unless i could get there before four okay, okay. All so right. uh, somebody also suggested instead of taking your phone out you could take a screenshot yes that's another thing you could do another technique <laughs> zoom is very has lots of options Okay, thank you all for coming, and uh, please look at our website to see all the programs we offer, which is chapelcalllibrary.org. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Okay. See you again. Bye. Bye, yep. everyone.